Well, good morning and welcome to our daily devotion. I am glad you are joining us. My name is Adam. If uh, you're jumping in for the first time today, welcome. We're glad you're here. We've been doing uh, this devotion now for several weeks going through the book of Philippians and today um, is the day we will finish. So uh, we've gone through literally every verse of the entire book of Philippians and today we're going to finish it up. So that's pretty exciting stuff. So as you're jumping in, let us know you're here. See Jessica's here and uh, Susan is here and uh, Susan, I'm glad you've been joining us and I know uh, Jerry gets to join us sometimes as well. So I invite both of y'all can do that. Uh, Shirley, Tracy, Molly, uh, Chad, Don, um, thank you all of you for joining us. Gail, Beverly, awesome, awesome. All right, so we're finishing up Philippians, like I said. I uh, got a few verses left to read today at the end of chapter four. A couple of things I think we can uh, take note of from that. But before we do, let me tell you the new book we're going to start tomorrow. So I've kind of been thinking about this for a couple of weeks, praying about this for a couple of weeks, trying to decide uh, where the Lord wanted us to go with this daily devotion. Because when I started this, I wasn't really sure how long we'd be doing this. And so I'm going to keep doing it as long as we're kind of in this season uh, that we're in. We're all kind of, you know, staying at home because we've been asked to. And so I want to go into the Old Testament next, and uh, the book we're going to do is the book of Ruth. So it's uh, one of my favorite books uh, in the entire Bible. There's so many unique features to it. Uh, there's so many uh, big kind of deep theological implications, but there's also like just this incredible narrative, love story, all of these things, uh, faithfulness kind of worked in together, and I'm really excited. So tomorrow we will begin the book of Ruth. So if you want to start reading the book of Ruth, it's only four chapters, so you can really read the entire story in one uh, uh, sitting if you'd like, and then we'll jump into that tomorrow, and we'll do the same thing that we've done in Philippians. We'll just kind of go through uh, one verse at a time, and so I see a few more guys have joined us, and so we're glad y'all are here. So let me read the last, how many we got here, the last four verses in the book of Philippians, and there's two things that I think we can really see from these last verses, Philippians chapter 4 verses 20 through 23. Excuse me, I'm going to start in verse 19. My bad. <clears throat> verses 19 through 23. Verse 19. And my God will meet all your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. Now, I left off yesterday at the, en at the end of verse 18, but verse 19 really completes that thought that he had been making in that uh, little paragraph. So let me kind of just backtrack just a moment to make sure we understand the context of that verse. Paul in verse 18, in verse 17 and 18 had said, I'm not looking for a gift, but I'm looking for what may be credited to your account. <clears throat> and as I mentioned yesterday, this is the church that financially supported Paul. He's thanking them for their gift. And what he's telling them is contentment is going to be present in my life either way. But the reason why I'm bringing this up is because I'm looking to see what may be credited to your account. And as I mentioned yesterday, this is reminiscent of the passage where Jesus tells us that we can store up treasures for ourselves in heaven. So verse 19 is tied to that thought. When Paul says, my God will meet all your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus, it's, it's just like when Jesus said, seek ye first the kingdom of God and all of these other things shall be added unto you. Do not store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust can destroy, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. But there's this direct correlation both from the teachings of Jesus and from what we see here, from the teachings of Paul, that when we choose to honor God with our finances by putting him first, by investing some of the money that we've been entrusted with in eternal purposes, in kingdom purposes, then what happens is God will meet our need. This is also a similar passage, that a similar teaching that we see from the Old Testament, where we see that if we return to God, he will, if we return to God's storehouse, then he will fill our barns with overflowing you know, this Old Testament language, and that's where we get the teaching from the tithe. So you get the tithe in the Old Testament, you get generosity in the New Testament, but the principle, whether you're looking in the Old Testament, the principle, whether you're looking at the teachings of Jesus, the principle, whether you're looking at Paul's writings in the New Testament, the principle remains the same. Whatever you want God's blessing in your life, put him first. So if you put God first in an area of your life, he'll bless you. He'll take care of your needs. Now, this is specifically tied to money. And so you can apply this in multiple areas of your life, but God meets our needs when we honor him with our finances. And there's, that's a very powerful statement. Way back when in um, February, which seems like a lifetime ago, but back in February, we had 57 households 
in our church take a four-month tithe challenge where they were going to trust God with their finances for four months and trust that God would meet their needs. And if they had any needs that went unmet, we as a church said, hey, we'll step up and we'll meet your need. We'll, we'll give you the money back. We'll, we'll do whatever we need to do. And uh, those families have continued to be remain faithful. I've heard from a few of them along the way. We're still following up them along the way. What they are experiencing for the first time, because these were families that up until this point had never taken that challenge, but what they're experiencing is the truth of this verse, is that when you trust God with your finances, he doesn't always give everything you want. He doesn't always like hook you up with everything that you think you might need, but he does meet your basic needs. God takes care of this. And Paul is reminding the church at Philippi that, and it's a great reminder for us as well. In verse 20, he says, to our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. And so this statement clearly is tied to the previous statement, which is saying God gets all the glory for this when he meets our needs. But it's also tied to this greater thought that he's been unpacking in all of chapter four, which is that our contentment is found in Christ. He, he knows what it's like to have a lot. He knows what it's like to have a little. Contentment ultimately comes from Jesus because he says he can do all of this through Christ's strength. Okay, So this whole idea of giving God the glory is, is one of those reminders that when good things happen in our lives, we don't take credit for it. We, we use it as something to point people to God and we use it to glorify his name. Now these last three verses is kind of his uh, conclusion to his letter. He's going to give a few shout outs, if you will, okay? And it's easy to kind of skip past this and just kind of go, all right, well, I guess the, the letter's over and he's just kind of mentioning a few people here and there's not a lot really there. But he says something really interesting in one of these verses and I think it has direct applications uh, for us today. So let me read the last three verses and we'll talk about what that application is. Verses 21 through 23. Greet all the saints in Christ Jesus. The brothers who are with me send greetings. And so Paul's just wanting them to, you know, be. he's just wanting to send along his, his greetings. All the saints send you greetings. And here's the phrase, especially those who belong to Caesar's household. We'll come back to that in just a minute. He concludes the letter by saying, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. When Paul says the phrase, especially those who belong to Caesar's household, these are Christians that he is passing along their greeting to the church at Philippi. And this is really interesting that Paul is saying, first of all, there are Christians in Caesar's household. The second thing is I think it's really interesting that they've had enough interaction with Paul that he is knowing they want him to pass along their greeting. And I mentioned way back when in Philippians chapter 1 that Paul is in a situation in prison that allows him to have visitors, allows him to interact with people. He doesn't have freedom, but he can still talk to people. And so apparently they've been coming to visit Paul, check on him from time to time. They know he's writing this letter and they want to pass along their greetings as well. But the biggest thing that we should notice when this pops out at us is who Caesar actually is. So a little bit of church history right now. Most scholars believe this letter was written during the AD 60s, kind of the early AD 60s. During that time period in Roman culture and in the city of Rome, the Caesar was Nero. And there was never a Caesar who persecuted more Christians than Nero. Now, the writing of this letter is probably around AD 63, AD 64. We can't give like an exact date. But in AD 67, Nero just turns on the Christians. It, the, the story is that a great fire, and I say story, like this is factual history. A fire broke out in the city of Rome, and it was it went on for weeks. It was uncontrollable. They finally got it put out. And Nero seized the opportunity to uh, start his persecution of Christians in a more formal way by blaming them for the start of this fire. Now, clearly, th this was not something that had happened. This was something that Nero had made up. But because he blamed the Christians for starting this fire in AD 67, the persecution of Christians, and this is where some of the horrific things we read about that happened to Christians in the first century, really began to happen. So this is a few years before that. But what we see here is that there are Christians who are literally living in Nero's household, that the gospel had managed to even penetrate the darkest of places. And isn't that like the gospel message? The gospel message has never been stopped. There's no, there's no amount of evil. There's no dictator. There's no ruler. There's no power on earth that can stop the presence and the spread of the gospel message all the way up to the doorstep of Nero, Christians in his household. I think that's amazing for us to see. And it's a reminder for us 
that in every situation and in every nation where we see things going on that we would go, wow, that, that's pretty terrible. Rest assured that God's people are close by. Rest assured that there are Christians there who are doing what they can to spread the gospel. I mean, I know of missionaries that are in countries right now that they're not supposed to be in. And I've had coffee with them when they come back to visit the States to raise support. And I'm thinking of one couple right now that has three young boys, just like we have three young boys. And they're in a nation right now where if they were caught, it would not go well for them. And yet they're there faithfully doing the work. And in many ways, they're like being in Caesar's household on Nero's doorstep. I mentioned yesterday the ministry center in the nation of Georgia that we're supporting building that's training Iranian nationals that are coming out of their own country, crossing over the border into the nation of Georgia, being trained to go back into Iran and, 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 and do church, but do church differently because they can't do church the way we do church because it's illegal. But see, the gospel keeps spreading. There's no amount of evil that can keep it from spreading. But then let me give you like a personal application that I think is important for us to see. Sometimes the best place for Christians to be in order for the gospel message to spread is in what seems to be a pretty dark place in what seems to be a setting or a culture that is not Christ-like. Let me see if I can explain further. I can't tell you how many times over the years I've had new Christians come and meet with me and say, you know, I recently came to faith in Jesus Christ. And one of the first things I realized is just how negative of a workplace I'm in. I mean, there are things that happen there that, that aren't very God honoring and the way people talk and the things they say, and even like some of the practices of the business. And I mean, I'm thinking that I should maybe quit and come work at the church because, you know, at the church, then it would be like this awesome Christian environment. Or maybe I should go work for a particular ministry. And I think I really need to work in a more positive environment. And ultimately, that's up to each person to be obedient to what God's leading them to do through the power of the Holy Spirit. And I always start the conversation with that. You got to do what you believe God leads you to do. But I challenge them with this. Might it be that God has you there to be a light? That light always shines brightest in the darkest places. And sometimes, fellow brothers and sisters in Christ, God has us in a workplace, in an environment, in a family setting, if we think about like our extended family, in a neighborhood, on the block, in a street, in a community, in a place where the majority of things happening around us aren't exactly God-honoring. And it can feel like that we should get out of that as quickly as possible to get into more favorable circumstances. And sometimes God may be leading you to do that. But sometimes God may be saying, no, this is why I have you here. That I want you to be a bright light. I want you to be a Christian in Caesar's household. I want you to be a follower of Jesus on Nero's doorstep. I want you to be in a dark place where the gospel message is not spread as quickly. I want you to be somewhere where there aren't as many churches. I want you to be somewhere where there's not as many people who read their Bible. I want you to be somewhere where there aren't people who do things that are very God-honoring. I want you to be somewhere where people have a different value system and they believe things different than what God's Word says. But I want you to be right in the middle of that because I'm calling you to be a light there. And we can never dismiss that that is part of our walk with the Lord. And so let me encourage you, like if, if you have some circles of your life that, you know, the people who are in them, the, the things that go on, they're not exactly God honoring, then maybe God has you there for a reason. Maybe God stirs some things in your life. I know we have a lot of military families and sometimes they find out they're going to be moving to a new location. And sometimes that location isn't as favorable as, let's just say, the South, where Christian principles are a little more prevalent. And might God be taking you, if you're a military family, into a new season and into a new place that may not be as culturally Christian, but you may have an opportunity to be a brighter light. Maybe you're not in the military, but maybe God eventually calls you to move somewhere or, or go somewhere else or, or, or you know settle into a place that you would have never imagined. You're like, I just, is that what God does? Listen, God does whatever he wants. Our role is to be obedient. What I'm simply trying to say is if God stirs some things in you, pay attention. Maybe you've got a high school student and they're thinking about going to college in the next few years. And as a parent, we want our kids to step into really positive Christian environments so they can have really good friends and, and all of the different kind of things. But, but also leave room for the conversation if your high school student comes to you and says, I think the Lord may be leading me to go to a place that isn't as much of a Christian environment because God wants me to be a light in that environment. Let's leave, leave room for that as well, that maybe that is what God is stirring in the heart of one of your high school students. 
I don't have the answer to all that, but I think it's incredible that at the end of this letter, we find out there are Christians in Caesar's household. And God, throughout 2,000 years of church history, has continued to place his people in the darkest of places and use them to be a light and let the gospel message continue to spread. So I hope that encourages you today that if you find yourself in sometimes some environments that aren't as God honoring, maybe God has you there for a reason. Maybe he wants to use you as a light. So I hope that encourages you today. Let me pray for you. And then maybe uh, we'll pray that God uses us in all circumstances today as well. So God, we thank you that you are faithful to continue to place your people in dark places whether it's Caesar's household, whether it's uh, cities in our own nation that unfortunately don't have as strong of a gospel presence, or New York comes to mind, all of the devastation that's happening right now with the death from COVID-19. And we know statistically speaking, there are not as many churches in New York City as there are in, say, Montgomery, Alabama, or Atlanta, Georgia, maybe some other places in the South. And so, Lord, for the Christians who are there, we ask that you would give them just a special empowerment of your spirit. Lord, I think of other dark places in our nation, like some cities out west, and Christianity is not as prevalent in, in those places, like Seattle or San Francisco or Denver or Los Angeles. Lord, maybe the Christians who are there, you could give them a special empowerment. But, Lord, we also know that in places like our own here in Montgomery, Alabama, there are still dark places, dark environments where the gospel message is not making a difference. And Lord, maybe some of us who are even joining in this devotion today recognize that you've given us uh, maybe a, a special opportunity. Maybe we're the Christians in Caesar's household. Maybe we have opportunities to be around lost people or, or, or environments that we would consider dark. And maybe recognize that you have us there for a reason, to be a light in a dark place. So Lord, we thank you for that. We thank you for your faithfulness in doing that. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I hope that encourages you today, and I hope that uh, you'll continue to just move forward in this season one day at a time, making sure you spend time in prayer each day, uh, talking to God about whatever it is that's on your heart, whatever it is that's on your mind. And as I mentioned earlier, we are continuing this daily devotion just because we finished one book doesn't mean we're going to stop the daily devotion. We're going to keep going for now, and tomorrow we're going to start in the book of Ruth. So if you want to read ahead, if you want to go ahead and begin to jump into this great little book from the Old Testament, you can do so, and uh, we'll get that started tomorrow. Until then, I hope you have a great day today. Thanks for joining us.